You know, Tom, you actually make this look so easy. But, um, you know, Greg has a question for you before we move on. This is a great question. And I'm really surprised uh, no one's actually asked this one before. So, uh, Greg, uh, ask Tom your question, please. Well, wow, thanks, Keith. Glad you, glad you like the question. <laughs> My question is, uh, how are you so good at gauging where people are at when they ask you a question and responding <clears throat> in a way that they will be able to understand and process at their level? Um, how did you develop the patience and restraint to do that properly? And maybe you can tell us some of the mistakes you made previously with <laughs> saying too much or saying the wrong thing. Well, you know, that that ability comes with working out of the being level as opposed to working out of the intellectual level. If you try to work out of the intellectual level and you try to then analyze, you know, well, a person asks a question, you know, what's the what's their problem? If you're doing that from the intellect, if you're doing that because you you um, are trying to, to understand it intellectually, that generally just gets you wadded up and you end up confusing yourself more than not. You know, we begin to believe that we know more than we know. And that's the problem. The best thing to do is just work at it at the being level from more of an intuitive level. And you kind of connect with the person so that you are feeling their feelings. You're getting the context of their question as well as the question, their emotional context of it. So you can feel that. And when you get their, their feelings, their emotional context of what's behind the question, then it makes it a lot easier to answer the question uh, so that they get what they need out of it as opposed to telling them something that they can't compute. So it's, it's, not, it's not so much a technique as it just is a way of, it's just a way of being. You relate to people on an intuitive level and when you do that, you get more than just what you see. You know, it's not like, you know, if, if it's an intellectual level, well, it's just what you see is what you get. But an intuitive level, you get a whole lot more than what you see. You know, when the, what you get in the question. You get a lot of other stuff with it, too. When you connect with that person as a, as a human being with feelings, with emotions, with problems, that's trying to do something, is frustrated, and you get all that sense of that feeling of where they are, then it gives you a better idea of what you have to tell them so that they will see the picture that they will, you know, something they can use because that's the whole point in communication is giving people information that they can actually process. And in order to do that, you have to have context as well as content. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but uh, it's not an intellectual technique. It's just a way of, of interacting with people that kind of lets the intellect sit down. Now, the intellect's still there. Obviously, I have to think about it. I have to find the words. I have to pull the processes together. I have to come up with something that's going to make sense and is coherent. So the intellect has some, something to do with that, but it's not, not necessarily the leader. It's just one of the tools. So when somebody get, uh, say it's like an email context where somebody would maybe email you a, a long list of questions uh, and there, there could be that temptation there for you to start responding with a lot of information from everything that you know from your experience. How do you find that restraint to like kind of back off a, a bit and just say, let's not go into all these angles and all these different things and let's keep it at where they're... Uh, you know, like how do you kind of close off all those those uh, different avenues that try to develop in a conversation? Well, usually you can see, and you know, email is different than something like we're doing here. What we're doing here, uh, it's not just the people whose pictures I'm looking at right now that are that are the the uh, recipients. You know, we are talking to an audience that will measure in the hundreds of thousands eventually here. So in this format, I have to answer the specific question for the individual, but I also have to go around and pick off all those more obvious questions that other people will have kind of surrounding this. In other words, if there were a whole lot of people 
out there that could then raise their hand right after this question because they have followed and questions that relate to that and questions that are similar from a little different perspective. I try to hit all of those too because I'm going to have 100,000 people watch this eventually and I'd like to give information that all of those people can find useful. So I tend to over answer questions in this format in the sense that I direct answer to individual. And particularly if I know that individual is saying something that's very, very common, you know, a common problem. Like our second, our second question was, I just can't get the point consciousness, you know, what can you tell me? Well, there's thousands and thousands of people that feel like that. Uh, you know, Polly's question, but I see this problem, you know, but the problem creates more problems and how do I deal with it? There's thousands and thousands of people that'll run into that. That's just really common. So I don't have to go too far. Afield. But other questions like the very first one we started with, I kind of went into a bigger picture with that to answer it directly, but answered it more in general, because it applies to lots and lots of things that a lot of other people are doing, not just the you know, trade center, but a lot of other things. So I make that more general. So this is a little different. And I get an email, and if it's got 20 questions, I look at all the questions and see what's the, what is the basic issue. Can we take these 20 questions and turn them into two basic issues? In which case, I ignore all 20 of the questions and just answer the two basic issues because that's really what they need to hear. All the questions are different aspects of those same two issues. So I tend to do that then. And he goes, any other audience, that one person. So I can be very specific for them and uh, and just answer their issues. And most things like that are related. See what the problem is. Now, my problem is sometimes I'll get a bunch of questions in an email and the, the problem is has so little understanding and information of what's going on and the nature of reality and the nature of themselves that I just can't begin. I'd have to sit down and write them 20 pages. We'd have to go through, you know, 20, you know, steps that just brought them up to the point, kind of the answer to their question. But I can't answer that question without answering a whole bunch of other things that I know they don't understand, which is why they are asking this question because I can't write pages, you know, per email. It isn't going to work. So those, those are the ones just don't answer at all. Or I answer with something like, uh, maybe you should watch such and such a DVD, you know, such and such a, a, a video on YouTube. It might help. Something very general like that, straight into the people, but it's too much. There's too much information I need to give to them before they'd understand it, that email is just not an appropriate uh, you know, media for me to do that in. Better for them to go on YouTube and listen to my talks. They get it a lot more out of that than uh, me spending that much time into trying to uh, give information to one person. So that's a that's another thing. So sometimes I don't answer an email because it's just too much to answer it well. To answer it to where it satisfies them is just too hard. In an email, it's sometimes if I can read 10 questions, I only have to write one paragraph because I can, I can wrap up all of those questions just into one basic misunderstanding and I can tell them that. Okay. So you have what people are thinking and feeling to be able to understand what's you know, what's going on in their minds. But, you know, that's a natural thing. If you think of where you were a decade ago, where were you in growing up a decade ago? And think of yourself at that point. All right. So you're a much less grown, probably a much more fearful person a decade ago. Now, you see other people that are the same place you were a decade ago. You understand them precisely. You know exactly what they're feeling because you've been there. You've felt that way. And now you've outgrown it. A decade later, you can see exactly what their issues are. And now it's easy for you to answer their questions 
And you also know that if you just went in and say, well, you know, here's the what you need to do, <laughs> that wouldn't work at all. That wouldn't help them. You see, that's not going to help them at all. The process you have to go through on your own. But see, you have that wisdom now that you understand what they're doing. And if they ask the question, you could give them a very, very good because you've been there and done that. Well, that's part of what I do. I've been there and done that. That I, it makes it so that I can understand where people are, what they're struggling with. Because those were my struggles at once, too. So looking downstream from where you've been, it's 2020 vision. You see things very clearly. You see where people need to go and where they're hung up. Looking upstream is very uh, myopic. Uh, there's no clear vision at all because there you don't have any experience. You're trying to figure it out on your own. So that's the that's part of the difference. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so Tom, we're now we're going to go on to uh, actually we're going to go back to Pally, who has a related question to uh, Greg's. Yep. So uh, Greg mentioned in his question also uh, a part where maybe you could mention some of your mistakes along your way of growing up here in this uh, current PMR experience. And I think you mentioned in some previous uh, video uh, that you one of your lessons was to somehow uh, well deal with uh, with uh, impatience or something like that. So I was wondering whether uh, you still work here on some lessons and uh, although you already answered as part of my question that you basically don't intellectually you, you cannot intellectually work on growing up i was wondering whether there's uh, anything uh, well you would uh, we would feel uh, is worth sharing in this respect in terms of your experience well you know i i had all the same issues that everybody else has you know i didn't skip any steps um, I had to figure it out pretty much, you know, from scratch also. And, you know, well, I probably, I maybe have come in a little different. I mean, we all come in a little different with the quality that we had, you know, from our individuated unit of consciousness. So all of us are a little different that way. But once we get here, we have to take whatever quality we have and we have to apply it to the choices that we get here. And from that perspective you know i've had to make those applications just like everybody else does and i've gotten stuck places uh like other people did and it was a slow thing but you have to realize i got in you know i started uh, going out to bob and rose in 1972 you know probably half probably three-fourths of my audience that's going to listen to this wasn't born in 1972 <laughs> so you know, I'm seven. I'm 71, almost 72 years old. I've been doing this a very long time, so I have more uh, more time, you know, more more time at the wheel, if you will, and, than than uh, than most of you have had. And it does take time. It is a slow process, and you just have to have that intent. The things that you refer to that that challenged me, and it hasn't been for well, I don't know, a long time back, decade or so, maybe two that this was a really big challenge was impatience with people, impatience that, you know, well, you know, for a, a minor example would be that, you know, when you're driving your car and people are doing things that are just not helpful, you know, they, they won't go when they should, you know, they don't slow down when they should, you know, all those sorts of things. They get in your way, they pull out in front of you, you know, and I'd have, uh, you know, I'd kind of grouse about that and complain and and so on. And, you know, I, I let that go a decade or two ago where it's just, you know, it is. People are how they are and they all need to get out and move around because you have to. You can't just stay in your house. And if you happen to be a driver that's kind of frightened of driving, then you're going to drive very, very cautiously and you're going to go very slow and do things that they need to go that slow. Because if you're that level of competence and that level of fear, going more quickly is just going to create an accident. You know, it's going to create a problem. So people are doing the best they can from wherever they are. And you just need to let them be and let them do it that way and not find them annoying. See, that being annoyed is a, is a uh, attitude problem. So, you know, some time back, you know, that was a lesson of mine. And I realized that lesson. They're like, what are you doing? You know, these people are just doing whatever they do for whatever the reason is. 
And it doesn't matter whether it's inappropriate or, you know, is, is a problem. It just is as it is. Deal with it gracefully. You see, it's that sort of thing. Don't, I was dealing with it, but not gracefully. So those kinds of things, you know, I, I remember, you know, and your relationship, particularly your, your, uh, your significant other relationships, but also family relationships, you know, relationships to parents and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters and all of those family relationships are often the places that you fail to be graceful. <laughs> you, know, you fail to, uh, to uh, be able to deal real well with those things. Uh, the people that you just know casually, well, okay, you can just let them be however they are. It's not a big deal. But your significant other, when they do something that reaches down and jerks on one of your fears, then that just kind of flares up and is a real big problem and it's hard to deal with. So those kinds of things, of course, are always going to be a challenge. So that's, that's where we have most of our challenges. Mostly we can, we can learn to deal with that outside environment. That's actually first struggle because that's the easy stuff to deal with. You know, your boss, your coworkers, uh, you know, the, the people in life that annoy you, you know, that sort of thing. That's the kind of the easy part. Once you get over that, then nobody annoys you anymore and everything is just fine. And you take whatever time you take. And if you're late, you're late. And if you're not, you're not. And you become much more laid back and easy as far as, you know, the way life has to happen. But then the next big set of challenges is, is those significant others, those family members, brothers and sisters and parents and so on, children, you know, that uh, you have a lot of attitudes about the way you want them to be relative to you, you know, the way you want your children to grow up, the attitudes you want them to have. And it looks like they're not having those attitudes. And that's a problem because you have a want for them to be a certain way. And of course, they're not going to be that. They're going to be whoever they are. And accepting that, that that's just the way it is and that's okay, see, is sometimes difficult. And with spouses, sometimes with parents, you know, there's all sorts of things there. So that's, that's probably the big place that people have issues. And I've had all those issues, you know, just like everybody else. And Sure, there's still things I need to learn. I don't think you ever get to the point where there's nothing yet you, le you need to learn. I believe if you get to the point where you believe there's nothing else for you to learn, that's probably a good problem to work on <laughs> all by itself because uh, there's always things to learn. There's always things that you could do better, things that, uh, you know, buttons that people can push, you know, that uh, you get uh, a personal reaction to that's not uh it's not really helpful and those things i think are are going to uh, always be around for me and everyone else and they just get different you know so all those things just like i was uh telling greg you know if you look back 10 years you can see a whole different you know, different person that you were 10 years ago and then you look back 20 years and it's even a more different person and that needs to continue i hope in another 10 years, I will be a different person than I am now. You see, there's, there needs to be learning all the time. Don't ever feel that you're there, that you've, that you've got it now, that, uh, you know, it's, you're, you're ahead of everyone and you can coast. That's a big mistake. You always have to realize that uh, you have places to grow up and there, you have ways of being that, are, that can be more helpful or less helpful. And that it's about other people. It's not so much about you. And as you get more, as you get better and better at that, the things that you have yet to learn just become maybe a little less obvious and more subtle. They're not so much the big thing. You know, the big thing is you get in a screaming argument with your, you know, with your children or with your parents or something like that, or your brother, you know, those are kind of the big things. And most of those will all go away eventually. But then there's more subtle things, uh, something that you could have been aware of or anticipate that you didn't, things that you uh, should have noticed about an individual and the way they felt, but you didn't because you weren't tuned in enough. You know, it, it just gets a little more subtle as time goes on and, and less of the big stuff. But sure, a lot of mistakes, 
you know, I, I don't know, we really call them mistakes. They're just that uh, you haven't yet grown up to the point where you can deal with things. It's not so much a mistake as it is just the way you are. And when you find it, you need to focus on it and work on it till you get rid of it. But that gets easier with time. That gets to be a faster and easier process to where you can change yourself now in days, maybe where it took six months or a year, you know, the first time you did it, you worked on it for a year or two. Now you can maybe work on it for a day or two and get the same result. So it gets more efficient process. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, although it may sound strange, it makes me feel better that knowing that you went through all this other well <laughs> stuff <laughs> as well as the people. And yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, it now connects us to the previous topic you, you mentioned uh, to Lawrence's question. Uh, I guess you are, well, it, it's easier to uh, have the right attitude towards learning when you do several rounds and maybe this is the difference you have compared to other people, but essentially we all go through the, well, the same stuff. Yes. Yeah, there's no way to avoid it. You know, you have to go through all that same stuff and you go through it every time you start with an avatar, but the more you've grown up, the faster you process through that stuff, the quicker it gets, the more obvious, you know, it is. And, uh, the more you grow up quickly, but you have to start from the beginning every time and uh, make all those decisions and basically re-earn it. You know, you've earned it once you have to, you have to actually have it, you know, when you can re-earn it again, that means you've got it, you know, you're, it's not, it's, it wasn't just a lucky fluke, you know, you, you can do it every time. So that's the difference. That's why I started out say we all come in at different places. So we, we don't all start exactly the same, but we all go through the same sort of things while we're here. Some will go through more efficiently. Some will struggle longer, but it's basically the same sort of thing that we all have to deal with. And, I have to deal with all of those. I still have things to deal with and I'll always have things to deal with. And so, well, everybody else, that's the, the growing doesn't get to the point I'm done. You know, it just gets to where it seems more subtle and not quite as, it doesn't make as big a splash. People don't notice as much, you know, it's a more subtle increments it gets asymptotic, I guess, eventually, but you're never done with it. Thank you. you know, Tom, you're, you're right, Tom. I mean, there are people that are always pushing buttons, trying to evoke um, a reaction from MBT events. Donna is obviously much better at dealing with it um, over the last seven or eight years than I am, but I've got there. Um, the latest thing on Facebook this weekend, I'm not going to mention any names, but it's why are you charging for vinyl or beats? Why are you charging so much for workshops? Why isn't it all free? Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's frustrating because we, we're not out to make money on, uh, on it from you or anything. It's all about the message and the information, but we, we have expenses that we have to cover. So, um, it's frustrating, but, uh, you do, you, you live with it. And, uh, I imagine for us, what we get compared to what you get is, uh, it's, 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 it's nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of different perspectives out there and, um, why isn't it free? you know, is, is one of them. And, and the whole economic um, paradigm has changed a lot. You know, it used to be in the old days that if you had something, you held it dear, you held it close, you didn't share it, and then you tried to get as much money as you could for it. You know, you'd parse it out as people needed it. It was a supply and demand. And if I had something that other people could use or, or wanted, then I could, I could make money with it. I could sell it. And that was kind of the old paradigm. And a lot of people are still working under that old paradigm. But now there's a newer paradigm that you can actually do better if you give things away. And you can, you know, you end up building more of a, of a, of a market for yourself by giving things away. And that's why we have things like YouTube. I don't have to pay YouTube a lot of money to put my stuff up on YouTube. You see, that's free. I don't have to pay money to go into Wikipedia and get a, you know, get an answer to some kind of thing. There's lots of services now and lots of information that's, that's free. Well, YouTube still makes a whole lot of money because they run ads on the side and they do other things. They just don't charge me. So you give stuff away free so that you have other ways that you can, you can, can market. So it's kind of a, a, a paradigm that's changing and people are beginning to expect free 
and I think they'll get more and more free, but there's only, you know, so much free that you can, that the system, you know, can run on because the system actually does cost money to run, you know, uh, all those, uh, computers and all that memory at YouTube isn't free. Somebody pays for that. Somebody buys it. And when the equipment runs, you know, gets old, they replace it. There's money being spent there. Uh, you know, just like we're planning this, this tour around the world and you don't do that for free. You know, the airline's not going to fly us for free. The restaurants don't feed us for free. You know, the hotels don't let us stay for free. You know, there's a lot of things we have to buy. We've already spent out of our pockets, what, three or $4,000 just in equipment, just in sound and video equipment that we're going to need to take the videos, you know, and that's all out of pocket. So there's stuff behind the scenes that isn't free. And somehow the process has to support that too. But we are moving to a thing where more things are free. And I think that's a good way to go. That's why my book, I published my book in 2003. And in that same year, I put it out on Google books for free, you see, and that's okay because I still can sell books because everybody doesn't want to sit and read a book on their, on their, you know, on their computer monitor. That's kind of a hard way to go to read books, but that's just the way things are evolving. And I think as things go on, we will find more and more free things. It's amazing now how much great stuff is free. I mean, there's tons of stuff out there that uh, doesn't cost a dime that 50 or 60 years ago would have been very high priced. Just the information is fantastic. So I think these people are, are that, that say that, you know, why isn't it free? Well, they're kind of used to a lot of things being free these days. And I think that's good that more things should be free, but there's limits. <laughs> you know, everything can't be free to everybody all the time or nothing would exist. You know, everything would, would go away because somebody's got to pay the bills in order to, to put the free stuff out there. The free stuff is never free to produce. It's never free to put up. You know, I only reason I can put stuff up on YouTube is because YouTube is making money selling ads. I don't allow any ads on my site. Well, you know, I'm not cooperating with them, but I don't want ads on my site because I find them very distracting when you start reading something and a big pop-up shows on top of what it is you're trying to read. You know, I, I don't like that and I don't want to engage in that, but they make enough money on the people who don't mind ads on their site that they can afford to let me put my stuff up without charge. So I think that's good. So see, I use free stuff too. I like free stuff and everybody else does, but and, you know, it can't be everything that's free. Somebody has to uh, generate the, the cash that it takes to make those things exist. And so some things you have to charge for, and sometimes you need more money than others, like at us on our trip, trying to raise money to support that trip. And that's just life. So, you know, deal with it gracefully, right? Sometimes <laughs> things are free and sometimes they're not. And you just got to deal with that gracefully. If only it was the airlines, hotels, venues, insurance, <laughs> restaurants, um, video equipment, Amazon. Thank you very much. Yeah. If, if only, if only they played the same game as, as us, Tom, that would be uh, a lot easier all, all over. Um, listen, we better get back to the questions because um, I've got a lot to get through here. So um, it's only, it's not even 6 a.m. in Sydney, but um, I do have a question from Mike, who is there and is very much looking forward to meeting us uh, in Sydney at the workshop. And um, before I ask his question, we're just going to go through some of the definitions again. So when I read the question, because we use a lot of the definitions, people will have it fresh in their mind what they are. LCS, larger consciousness system. IUOC, individuated units of consciousness. F W A U, free will awareness units, and R W W, the reality wide web. Here is Mike's question, Tom. It's my understanding that the LCS is actually all the IUOCs as one whole. F W A U's are constrained compartments. I'm not sure if that's the right word, or portions of each IUOC projected into a virtual reality for the purpose of experiencing reality in a myriad of different ways learning how to become love or reduce entropy in all these different ways and learning lab environments. As each free will awareness unit makes choices in all these differing VRs, each IUOC either evolves or de-evolves from those choices. 
Now, if the FWAU is the mechanism for the expression of free will, where the actual choices are made, is the IUOC the fabric of the RWW that connects the effects of each free will choice made by each FWAU to the LCS? Are you following so far, Tom? Are you all right? <laughs> okay. Um, so basically... Uh, are we all free will? Are we as free will awareness units like individual fish swimming in the ocean of all our netted IUOCs? The fish are individually self aware, but the ocean is not as such, but perhaps conscious in some other way. Uh, Mike keeps having these amazing glimpses of realization, but it's quite a challenge for him to put this into words. He says he hopes he's making sense. So is he? <laughs> yeah, but he has to realize that don't take these these um, constructs, okay, which is free will awareness units, individual units of consciousness, um, larger conscious system. These are all these are all logical constructs that are there to serve a as a, as a functional part of the of the system, this larger consciousness system. Don't take those too literally. Okay, some people will get real wound up over a very literal idea that you know they see little free will awareness units out there you know existing independently you know on their own and then they see this other thing and it's you know everything's independent because that's the way we think because of our our experience here in this physical reality physical quote unquote you know this virtual reality we call physical matter reality everything is separate and everything are separate actors and then they all interact uh, with each other don't think of it that way. Think of all these things as parts of the larger consciousness system. And as such, the, the reason we define them separately is just so we can talk about the separate functions. That's why we give them labels and give them names so that we can have a conversation about the various functions of consciousness. You see, it's not that this consciousness system is really broken up into whole bunches of little individual pieces that interact. So understand that these things are metaphors. They're not facts. They're metaphors. There's ways for us to talk and don't get too twisted up over trying to get all the pieces, you know, interacting in the right way. That's a holdover from the way we think here in this physical reality. So that'd be my first caution to it. Other than that, the, everything he said sounded pretty reasonable. Except in the beginning, uh, he talked about all the IUOCs basically make up the LCS. And that's probably not a good way to say it. The better way to say it would be all the IUOCs are just part of the LCS. There's other functions that the LCS has other than the function of IUOC. The larger conscious system also has to have a, what do we call it, the, the uh, executive branch, if you will, uh, the operating system, you know, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of uh, things that have to be done, you know, a lot of maintenance. You know, we talk about, you know, some things can't be free. You know, the whole thing doesn't exist just, just out of nowhere. It exists on top of a, of a big consciousness computer, you know, a big function going on there. That is the operating system, the executive function. And this function is... You may call this whole function just a, another bigger, brighter, smarter, lower entropy IUOC, and you could use that metaphor, and that might work, and then everything would just be IUOCs, or you could say that this function is kind of different than an IUOC because it is bigger and better and lower entropy and has a bigger view and has its hands into more things going on than most of the IUOCs do. So whether you break those out as the same or separate is irrelevant. Is those metaphors? What makes it easier for us to talk about these various functions? And either way, as long as you define your metaphor, then that's acceptable. Um, so we do have a part of the part of the function of consciousness system is this executive part. You know, I mean, somebody has to have, you know, create the computer that computes our virtual reality. That's a dedicated full time computer. Well, that's a part of the LCS. It's not really an IUOC. It's it's a just a part of the larger consciousness system, as are we. We, IUOCs, are a part of the larger consciousness system. Okay. We just break them up into, into, and give them names so that we can talk about these different functions. Without a name, we can't talk about it. 
that's the way our language works. We need nouns and verbs in order to make sentences so that we can talk. So nouns are names of things we have to talk about. So mostly what he said was fine. And if he considers it metaphors, then I think he's good to go with, with that. Um, the individuated units of consciousness don't necessarily make up the reality wide web. The, the reality wide web is the network that all consciousness is netted. Okay, you can think of that as a network, just like the internet's a network. Well, and the internet as a network has infrastructure. You know, there's infrastructure someplace between your computer and my computer, as we sit here and do this, there's a whole lot of servers and, and, you know, satellites moving things around the globe and, you know, various big computer centers that take the packets and pass them on to the next center. And there's a lot of infrastructure going on behind that. And the internet is not just the people on it, the people using it. So we individuated units of consciousness and all, all of us, all conscious entities, all can communicate with each other. But there's going to be some infrastructure with that. Some language that we use, some ways that the information gets, you know, gets put from, from uh, our consciousness into data. Data gets rearranged. Now you say data gets moved between the sender and the receiver. Well, there's no space. You see, that's a conceptual thing. We're not moving data from one place to another. That's just our concept. That's another metaphor that we might use. But still, we should say that there's going to be some infrastructure to support all that, just like there's infrastructure to support the computation of this virtual reality and other infrastructure to support the computation of some other virtual reality. Now, that all this infrastructure is all just one thing, just one big computer that does it all, well, that's okay. That's just another metaphor. Or do we talk about each one having its own little computer to do it? Just another way of talking about it. So I'd rather just say this is the larger consciousness system. It has these functions. It does these services. And the Reality Wide Web is one of the services that it provides, part of the infrastructure it provides that we can all communicate with each other. Um, consciousness to consciousness. We can share information. We can go up and get information out of databases. And this that's what that's what Consciousness is, it's an information system. That's what it does. It moves information around. So it's, it's uh, you know, part of its nature. And when I make up the term reality wide web, I'm just giving you a, a structure in your mind that you can think about sort of like an internet, just a web of connections of all the consciousness. And we can go, okay, I got that concept. But we have to kind of put it in those sorts of, physical terms, if you will, before you get it as a concept. So don't take those physical terms too seriously other than the, than the metaphors that talk about functions. I don't know if that's going to help him or not, but uh, hopefully it will. But he generally had it right. It was just uh, maybe a couple of details that weren't quite right. But yeah, he sounded like maybe he's getting a little too wound up over the individual pieces, being really real separate pieces. They're not. We're all just parts of this larger system. Right. Well, noted. So, okay, Tom, in that case, we know what the LCS is. Let's have a look at now f with a question from Jack on the MBT forum about what options the LCS actually has. Um, Jack says, at the moment, the world is going through a period of technological evolution, which increases the potential for consciousness to evolve greatly compared to the previous few hundred thousand years of human evolution. Mm -hmm. This got me thinking about the LCS and the potential options that it might have. For example, is it possible that the LCS could copy and paste our universe, more specifically Earth, as it was in around the year 1500, press the run button and then have IUOCs to incarnate into the newborn babies and just have all the currently alive live people played by non-player characters until the avatars die this seems a far more efficient way for the system to optimize potential growth than to have the start from the big bang every time or even the start of human history which had thousands of years of slow growth potential until just recently sure it can do that and anything it can do to make the process more efficient it probably will do it's an information system and if can uh you know, manipulate that information 
and those virtual realities uh, any way it likes. It's a tool. Virtual reality is a tool for the for the LCS. It's a way of of uh, increasing the rate of entropy reduction. So, if it's a tool, use the tool any way that the tool you know works well. If the tool's got a sharp edge, then you can cut with it. You know, well, this is an information tool, and you can copy and paste. And um, if you have a particularly interesting um, piece. Or maybe you have a piece that went wrong. You know, we get to this point, we're progressing nicely, progressing nicely, and oh, from here on, it just all kind of went to hell in the handbasket and then blows up. Well, you might want to go back to just before it turned wrong, understand, you know, what the things were there, adjust it slightly, and paste it back in and say, all right, guys, let's give it another try. See if you can do better with this one. You know, you the other one you may just let go on and do what it's doing, but in order to make it as efficient as possible, you may start someplace else, you see, and go again. So sure, that's what you can do with digital systems. It's uh, They're very, very flexible, and they have lots of options. It's... it's uh, you know, it's a it's a system with with uh, almost unlimited options. Now, once you have a virtual reality, you know your options are limited by making things change in that reality outside of what is normal for that reality, because then you might create problems. So the system has to be a little clever about how it nudges us that it's not too uh, obvious, and uh, it has some constraints like that. But basically. There's very few constraints on the system, and there's lots of possibilities. And yes, it could do all those things. It could, um, you know, I, I've been to multiple uh, physical realities, if you will. By that, I mean multiple reality frames where the rule set is really tight enough to make what we would call a physical reality. Were those all knockoffs of, of you know, the first one? Could be. Were they branches that looked particularly interesting to see how they'd work out? And then they got planted there? Could be. Uh, I find that a whole lot of it is similar in the sense that the realities tend to be more or less like ours. Now, sometimes the things there, the life forms in there look pretty different. And uh, sometimes, you know, some of, the, some of the rules, it seems, in the rule set are different, but they're pretty similar. Is that because they were all started as a copy and paste? Or is that because that there's only a very small set of conditions that produce a stable virtual reality? By stable, we mean, you know, this virtual reality, if we start, we start at the big digital bang, you know, has to go on for a long time to give all of this that is, has evolved a chance to evolve before it self-destructs. So you need a very stable system. And that stability is probably hard in a virtual reality you know, and how it evolves. It's probably hard to get there. That's probably what turns out to, to answer the question about this anthropic principle about we have a half a dozen constants and other things in our rule set that down to, you know, 15 decimal places, you know, have to be precisely like that. Otherwise, this reality wouldn't be stable. You know, it would come apart. And it's like, wow, how did we get a reality that was, you know, how do we get all this, this fine tuning in our reality just so we could evolve? Well, that's because we're the whole point of it. <laughs> our evolution is the point of it. So you tune it until it works. So the, the rule set itself evolves. So you start with a rule set and you say, well, let's try this rule set. And it doesn't last long enough to evolve anything interesting. So you tweak it and you do it again, and then you tweak it and do it again. And then maybe you've done that a million times before you finally get to the point that you got that last decimal, you know, in that 15th decimal place just right so that the thing uh, will last for, what, uh, you know, six or seven billion years or so to let everything uh, evolve in a, in a way that's interesting to the system. So, yeah, there's, there's tremendous uh, uh, opportunity in our system. Now, once our system's figured out how to get a stable reality, I suspect it would it would use those same parameters over and over again, just still maybe tweaking them a little more this way and that way to uh, make other reality frames. I doubt they'd start from scratch and have to learn everything all over again. That wouldn't be very smart. So 
Yes, it's copy paste. Uh, use what you've learned. I don't think it's there's there's hardly any constraints that I can think of. You know, digital systems are very very uh, flexible. That's why we have digital computers, because the first computers were analog computers. Analog computers were very fast and did what they were designed to do very well, but they weren't flexible. They were designed for special purposes, and that purpose is all they could do. You couldn't do anything different than that particular purpose they were designed for, whereas a digital computer could do everything. Extremely flexible. It's a great system. And that's one of the reasons you know that the system is really well designed because it's been evolving its design for a long time. It's a tool and the system will redesign and, and rework its tools to get maximum benefit out of them. You know, if what you need is an ax with a blade on both sides, well, you know, you'll, you'll invent one if that solves a problem. So, yes, all that could happen and more. <laughs> We shall we shall see where it goes. Then that's that's interesting. I think that's going to generate even more questions. <laughs> so that one's going to be uh, <laughs> no doubt. That one's going to be an avalanche. Um, we're going to move on to something. Um, it's it's relating to Kundalini. Now I know the word, but I really don't know a lot about Kundalini. So uh, the question is from Mikhail Grushka, who is over in Krakow, Poland, where we hope to get to in 2018. Um, and he writes, uh, Tom, I've seen a thread where you speak on the awakening of Kundalini. I had a theory about it, and what you said there seems to fit well with my ideas. As I understand it, Kundalini Awakening is an event where an avatar goes through some kind of modification, or, if you will, an update, which allows for more awareness. How I see it, maybe an IUOC being like a race car driver, the avatar being like the car itself, and the quality of consciousness, the driver's skills. A good driver would handle a slow, mediocre car well, but in that car, he may hardly be distinguishable for any other regular driver. But where the real difference would, of skill would be seen is if you would put them into a faster racing car. So, for example, a good driver, or RUOC, is proficient but limited in its regular car or avatar body mind. So there comes a time when it is necessary to switch to a much faster car so that that driver can keep growing. So is this what Kundalini Awakening is all about then? An upgrade in an avatar's body-mind mechanism so that he can process more? The higher quality of consciousness, the more, IO, uh, the more an IUOC can efficiently handle, right? Yes, that's probably a, a good set of metaphors for it. That's, that is the main, that's the main part of it. It is, a, it is an event that happens when you get to the point where you need it to happen, where you've earned that happening, where you are, as he said, you're, uh, you're ready for, a, for the next, for the next level. And then there's a, there's a bit of a, a bit of a change that takes place that allows you to operate at a little different speed. Yeah. It's probably a good metaphor for it. I, I think of the, um, of the Kundalini event more as, as like a, a, um, what do we call it? A, uh, now the, the words are escaping me. It's almost like a, an initiation into a, a new level. It's like when you're playing World of Warcraft and you go up a level, you know, that suddenly you get, you get five new spells <laughs> and, uh, you know, and 10% and, and increase in hit points, you know, because you've just passed more than the, you know, certain number of your, you just went from level 40 to level 50 so you you get a bunch of of new things and it's kind of like that yeah it's an upgrade it's a um it's a point you can get to now you can you can push because it is something that is a that's part you know the, the body's a, a virtual body now remember it's a virtual body so this is something that's being done in the in the uh in the computer you know, we're consciousness. We're also an information system. Our physical body is also information according to the rule set. But it, uh, you get to a point where you have earned the, the uh, or, or need, I guess would be the better thing, you know, that you need a, a, a better situation in which to function. And that's what the Kundalini represents. It's a it's a uh, kind of rite of passage, perhaps, 
Now, whether your passage is going from level 40 to level 50 in World of Warcraft, whatever you can find your passage as, but it's a kind of a, a, a rite of passage. You get new, uh, you get new bennies based on, on your development as you go. You can push that. If you use your intent to push that where you get it before you're ready for it, it usually doesn't work out very well. That's another thing. You can do exercises that encourage these changes to take place. You can use your intent to encourage these changes to take place. And if you are successful in pushing this ahead of its time, usually that's not a good thing. Better off to just let it happen as it happens. It's not good, and using his metaphor, it's not good to take a mediocre driver and put him behind the wheel of a car, you know, that has 800 horsepower. You know, it's just not, they're going to kill themselves, right? They're going to, they're going to uh, not be able to deal with that kind of, of uh, speed or acceleration or power, and it's just not useful. You know, it's not a good thing to do to go out and buy your 16-year-old who just got his driver's license, a brand new Corvette, you know, with uh, 400 horsepower. Probably a poor decision on the part of the parent because uh, they're probably not ready for that yet. So if you push the Kundalini process ahead of where it's natural, it's it's uh, like being 16 years old and your parents give you a Corvette. You know, you have to be a little careful. You just get yourself in trouble. So I'm not in favor of pushing on that, but it's something that happens. And it, and again, the Kundalini is a metaphor. You know, it's not this physical process that something goes in and, and, you know, changes your physical body. Your physical body isn't a physical body. It's also information. It's just a, it's, it's a, a better analogy is the bennies you get when you go from a level 40 to a level 50, uh, you know, uh, character in World of Warcraft. You know, you get some additional things that you can use. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that, Tom. I, I now have to apologize to my son. Uh, Lewis, I guess you're not getting that Corvette for your 16th birthday next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Save me a whole bunch of money there. Uh, yeah, probably <laughs> saved his life, too. <laughs> almost certainly, yeah. Actually, the kid doesn't want to drive. He says at the moment uh, he doesn't want to drive. That'll, that'll change, but, you know. That's, that's easy to say when you're 14. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um the necessity for sleep, Tom. Question from MBT Forum user Entropy78. Do all entities require sleep and is sleep fundamental or is sleep only a requirement for free will awareness units contained within our particular rule set or experience packet? Short question, but I'm sure it's not going to be a short answer. <laughs> Answers are never short. Um... Sleep is particular to us being in this physical-like virtual reality. It has several functions that, that are important. Uh, it has a, 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 a rule set function that it's important for the, for, the, uh, for the rule set functions that have to take place in a physical, in a physical right, in a virtual body that's physical, that has this, this rule set. All of our biology has to follow rules and the body needs some downtime to catch up on you know getting rid of uh, byproducts of metabolism and other things so there's some rule set requirements for sleep and it's it's uh, about the way the rule set re you know does biology so that's one thing another thing that's required uh, with sleep is that it gives us a, without us having to learn anything, learn to meditate or do anything else, it gives us access to another reality frame, the dreaming frame, in which we can continue to learn with a whole different set of experiences than we can have here. So it enables us to have access, if you will, to another set of classrooms that otherwise we wouldn't have access to. And these classrooms are important because the choices we get in the dream reality are different than the kind of choices we get here. It's, uh, you know, very dramatic things can happen to us in a dream reality that would have many repercussions and consequences if they happened here, but they can just happen there and, and you can make decisions that are fatal in the dream reality. And of course you always wake up in the morning in your bed nice and well and 
healthy. So it's a it's a very interesting learning place. We get that out of the sleep. And the other thing we get out of sleep is that it kind of gives us a, a chance to, uh, uh, maybe I should say uh, the metaphor, reboot. When we sleep, we tend to let go of a lot of the things that we're wound up with. So if we get obsessed or if we're upset with something and it's just we're churning on it and churning on it and it's, it's dominating our thoughts and our minds and our attitudes, and, you know, there's this old phrase that says, well, sleep on it. Things will, things will be different in the morning. Well, that's true. They are. It's like getting a reboot. You go to sleep, and when you wake up the next morning, all of that uh, obsession has been broken because you've, you've let go of it. And now starting over without the obsession, creating more obsessions. So the obsession creates more obsession, which creates more, and it gets into these, these loops that um, are dysfunctional. And sleep is one way that we break out of those loops. So it's in a way, it's like a reboot. It's a reset for us, for our consciousness, to give us downtime, to stop the intellect from cranking, to shut that intellect down for a while and then reboot it fresh the next day. Yes, those problems are still there, but now your perspective is a little different because you've gotten out of your obsession. You're not wound up in it emotionally. So it has a lot of benefits for us, a new, rea a new re reality to, or a different kind of reality with uh, not a tight rule set in order to learn in. We get to reset, get out of our obsessions and things that we're too wound up with, and our body needs some downtime by the rule set in order to do all the processing and things that it has to do uh, that it's evolved to, to need. So that's the that's kind of the way that works. Now, if you go into the non-physical with a very loose rule set, like you would have in the outer body, then sleep is not an issue. And I guess it's more difficult for them to get out of obsessions. You get into a, to an obsessive uh, uh, cycle, you know, uh, what do we call it? like endless loop in a, in a program where it's just self, you know, self-energizing endless loop goes round and round and round. Um, there's a harder to get out of if you don't sleep and in the non-physical, there's no need for sleep. You don't have a physical body that needs rule set doesn't demand anything like that. So there, there is no downtime. It's all uptime, but there's a, there's a penalty to pay there. <laughs> your, your obsessions are something you have to deal with and you don't have that reset. Oh, you're talking about obsessions. What about uh, MBT's view on addiction? Uh, Event Horizon asks, you know, literally that question, what is MBT's view on addiction? And he's or she is talking about source, underlying fear, PMR, consciousness, connections, etc. Okay, well, we have to look at addictions since we're talking here with, we're, we're, we have all our avatars up on the screen, you know, talking to other avatars. Uh, so we have to look at it from a physical and from a conscious standpoint. You have, you have addiction, addictions that are biological, okay, where your body, according to the rule set, gets certain substances and wants more of them, you know, gets addicted to them. They stop producing um, things of their own. Let's say uh, your body produces a certain amount of... Um, Oh, uh, I don't know, some sort of chemical. And when you take, well, neo, uh, neosinephrine was one of those, right? It was, a, it was a nose spray. If you had stuffy head, you'd stuff this nose spray up and it would clear your head up. But the problem was that your body made similar chemicals to what was in that nose spray to clear your head up itself. And once you start using them from the bottle, your body stops making them. So what happened is, yes, you can use that. It cleared your head up really well, but you can't stop using it because every time you stop using it, your head just clogs up and stays that way because your body's quit making the chemical that serves that purpose. You see, it says, oh, I don't need to make this anymore. You know, that's coming from someplace else. So it, it shuts down production. So now your body has just become addicted to neosinephrine. That would, I don't even know they sell it on the market anymore because that was a problem with it. People would use it for two or three weeks and then they couldn't stop using it. Every time they tried to stop, they'd have a terrible sinus issue. So 
there's those things. There's the physical thing. And that works, of course, with, with some drugs, alcohol, other things where your body will get addicted to it and it requires it after that. It stops making, it, it, it interrupts its balance. It's no longer balanced. It's out of balance. And this foreign substance now is part of its new dysfunctional balance. So that's why you get withdrawals from things that you're addicted to. So that's the physical side of the picture. On the mental side of the picture, on the conscious side of the picture, uh, we get into obsessions with things that uh, turn out to act a lot like addictions, things we need, things we get withdrawals that they're taking away from us. Uh, those are usually generated by our fear, by our ego, by our beliefs, and all they are is, is um, a fixation on things being a certain way. Well, we know that our intent helps produce our future. Future reality is, is a function of intent. So as we, we can get into these loops where we create the reality that, that um, kind of feeds on itself and we get in, a, in a, what, what in electronics is called a positive feedback loop. That means a positive feedback would be if you press on the accelerator and you go faster, there's a, there's a, a feedback in your car that says, if you go faster, then press the accelerator more. So then you press the accelerator and you go faster and that thing says, oh, the accelerator's been pressed again, go faster. And you just keep going faster and faster, of course, until it can't go any faster. That's a positive feedback loop, whereas the, the feedback increases the activity that's happening, which increases the feedback, which increases the activity that's happening. So we get into those kinds of obsessions uh, in our consciousness and some of that uh, comes out as, as mental illness. Sometimes uh, people are just seen as eccentric because they have these, these things. And, and what's in the conscious and what's in the body, what's in the, the rule set that governs how the body works, those two things can intermix. So there's this big thing of addiction that's both consciousness-based and biology-based, and those two interacting with each other. Um, mostly it takes willpower to get over addiction. You have to really want to get over it. And then you can break the cycle and let the, let the body, let the biology re, uh, you know, reestablish a balance without the, without the addictive substance or let the mind and the conscious reestablish a balance, you know, without the, uh, positive feedback driving the, driving the thoughts. So addiction is a real is a real thing. It's not something we're helpless in the face of. We can change that. It's just that it takes willpower. You have to really want to to do it. And of course, what the addiction makes you feel like is that you don't want to.